Uh, this is a great time or an exciting time to be talking about the question about presidential powers, considering the fact that we have a new president and there's lots of people who are assuming it's going to be back to business as usual or it's going to be somewhat more staid or easy. So I'm here to tell you, perhaps disappointingly, that unfortunately we're at a, a very warped state of the constitutional system. So I'll try and start from the beginning by moving a few things around here. But, uh, you know, obviously we've seen, we've all seen this very iconic image uh, and we, we know all the abuses of power that came after it. So much like just, as I just said, it's important to think through, you know, was George Bush, George W. Bush rather a fluke or was it more systemic? And really, you know, the prosecution of the war on terror with Guantanamo Bay, the enhanced interrogation techniques, uh, the Patriot Act and a variety of problems. It seems as if the big problem or the big concern that we had was the Bush presidency or the growth of uh, presidential powers after 9-11. But most recently, Trump has ordered the lethal drone strike against Qasem Soleimani, who was a very well-respected member of the Iranian government. And we have boots on the ground. We don't call it always that. Uh, in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, and those are the wars that we, or those are the boots that we talk about. Uh, we've been in at least one of these countries since 2001. And so of these operations, what can we really say has been authorized by Congress? Now we went to Afghanistan to get everyone connected or as many people as we could connected with 9-11 and the countries that harbored them. And it's safe to say that, um, you know, Al Qaeda is not really operating the way it used to in Afghanistan. And we know at this point that the Taliban isn't going anywhere. Uh, the Iraq war ended in 2011, only to be restarted three years later due to the threat of ISIS. And I'd ask again, what authorization is the president using for military force in Afghanistan and Iraq? Now, uh, the president currently Trump for just presumably Biden, we'll see what happens in the next two months. Um, they can really cite the 2001 and 2002 authorizations for the use of military force, which are so open-ended that they have let three presidents over two decades uh, claim that they can carry out any operation pretty much anywhere in the world without being meaningfully stopped by Congress. And that's essentially what passes for oversight these days. So did it have to be this way? Right? Terrorists are generally a stateless enemy and therefore comparatively mobile. That means when they hit us, it's very hard for us to have a where, uh, an address to send the cavalry. Uh, that's a different kind of enemy than the US was used to fighting with a military rather than say a police force. Right? So it would be natural that there were some errors in judgment and errors in execution when we were trying to fight this new kind of threat. That is not, however, the whole story. At present, we see a lack of well-defined and well-executed policy because the constitutional system has been warped beyond recognition. Presidents enjoy an irresponsible level of unilateral control in the realm of war. And by having so much control with so little oversight from Congress, the people, or the courts, they've become accustomed to reacting rather than planning their foreign policy decisions. Without the deliberation provided by the Congress, presidents are often pushed and pulled by events rather than shaping them. This is not, however, exclusively a problem with the executive branch. Congress still has the constitutional power it needs to check the president and stop him from acting so irresponsibly, but they don't and haven't, even with this president. So in essence, due to the constitutional changes over the past 70 years, we lack the process necessary for creating grand strategy, let alone executing it. So what I'd like to do in this talk is lay the groundwork for how we ended up with a presidency that can use this power and the US military so unilaterally. Um, what I hope to do is explain how we got here. Now, fortunately for you, I'm fairly confident I have the answer. Uh, by looking back at the constitutional structure and the structural changes that came uh, during the Cold War, I can show how this healthy but delicate separation of power system got warped. Now, to calibrate expectations, I have a diagnosis, but I don't have a viable cure yet. Uh, as we move through history, I hope you'll start to see why we've gotten to this point. And in order to bring that more to light after discussing the structure of the separation of powers, and a, maybe a few historical examples, 
I'll talk about some more recent examples from Obama's actions in Syria in 2014, and then I'll dig farther into what happened with Soleimani. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, we see here this very famous uh, quote from the Federalist Papers, right, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. And besides the fact that it's just nice to see what it looks like when serious people start talking about institutions and how they're formed, uh, it's also important to see that this is how the structure was supposed to support our government and ensure that our government was less able to encroach on the powers of other parts of the government, as well as becoming abusive of power just as a whole. Okay. So ambition is made to counteract ambition and the interests of the man or person now uh, are supposed to be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. So what's happening therefore is that the constitution itself is shaping interests, right? And you don't need virtuous people who are you know, always high-minded and concerned about the common good to run a successful government with this kind of institutional structure. What you really need is you need people who are jealously guarding their powers and looking at the other branches and saying that person, that group is trying to take my power and I wanna keep it for myself, okay? <clears throat> and what happens here because the institution, uh, because sorry, the, the place where you are within the constitutional structure shapes your interest, what will happen and does happen is when you move from one branch, say the legislature to the executive branch, then your interests change. So when Obama and Biden, for example, moved from the Senate to the executive branch, it was very honest and very understandable that their view of war powers changed. So when they were in the legislative branch, they thought it was very important that the legislature had a lot of control and a lot of constraint on the executive. When they got into the executive branch, they were more than happy to have very limited control and very disinclined to chat with the legislative branch about the kinds of things they wanted to do in military policy, let alone how they were broadly conducting foreign policy. Okay. And so I wanna go into then the, the last sentence here of the quote. So it starts here. Um, in the framing of a government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and the next place oblige it to control itself. So how do you get it to control itself, right? The constitution was a reaction against the very decentralized powers of the Articles of Confederation and the near failure status of the state of, the, um, of America when it first started out, okay? As they moved to put more power in the federal government, however, they necessarily created a government that could abuse its power. This is why Madison says, perhaps too honestly in Federalist 37, that he wasn't really sure if we could have stability, energy, and liberty all together in one system of government. So we contrast this with the monarchic system. So he says, monarchy requires two parts. Okay, you've got stability, which is power in the hands of a few held for a long time, and energy, power in the hands of one for a medium amount of time. So here he's talking about the House of Lords, and the monarch, right, the sovereign. And he says, we know that that works, right? We have great examples from Europe of the monarchy working. And so whatever you happen to think of 18th century monarchy, Madison was like, they figured it out. It works pretty well. What the US was trying to do and what was arguably a unique uh, experiment in history at the time was combine those two things with liberty, namely many people holding power for a short amount of time. And it's really hard to, con to control that. It's really hard to control liberty because once you bring in liberty, once you bring many people holding a small amount of power for a short amount of time, or just sorry, power for a short amount of time, you allow the people to be very connected to their representatives. And that allows the possibility or a much greater possibility that the, the emotions, the passions of the people can enter the laws. And what I mean by this is that when we're scared, um, angry, fearful, frenzied, we can ask our legislators to, to change the laws, right? Potentially even change the constitutional structure in order to address those concerns of ours. And so a good and clear and clean recent example is the Patriot Act. 
right? Had Americans known, or I would argue, had Americans known what was in the Patriot Act right from the start, if they had known the level of spying that the government could do and the limited amount of control that we had placed on that spying, I would bet that 60, 70, 80% of Americans in 2001, 2002 would have said, go ahead, right? Spy on grandma, you know, figure out who she's talking to, who knows if we can trust her because we were just all so fearful about what had just happened. And there was this desperate desire to have the government protect us. And so the constitution is supposed to balance that, right? It's supposed to balance that with liberty, that concern for security with liberty and roughly allow them to sort of eager, even out. And the biggest concern here is then during times of war or perhaps more broadly during times of some kind of, nat of, of emergency, right? Not a natural disaster, but something like a terrorist attack if it's not a time of war. So this is what Madison says about war. This is a quote from uh, Madison speaking as Helvidius. This is the very famous Pacificus Helvidius debates held in 1793. Three, four, I think they went over a whole year. And essentially what happens, just to pause before we go into the quote, I'm not gonna read it, but you guys can read it while I'm talking. My students always need at least two things to do. So I'll give you guys two things to do. Uh, this debate between them was essentially Hamilton supporting George Washington who had declared neutrality and said, listen, uh, France and England are at war with each other. We get it. We know you guys love to fight with each other, but we're not getting involved. So you guys have it out, we are neutral. We're explaining to you and our people that we as the government are claiming neutrality. So anything anyone does who's American to help either side, that's not sanctioned by the government, right? This is a very normal and useful tool in the president's arsenal for trying to tell other countries as well as American citizens, be careful what you do because we're not going to protect you if you start getting us involved in something we don't want to be involved in. So they do that. Hamilton then says, I should probably support Washington because he's declared neutrality or proclaimed neutrality. The reason why he felt he needed to support Washington is because obviously Congress has the power to declare war. Thus the contrary power to declare peace could be viewed as housed within the legislative branch. So uh, Hamilton is saying, no, 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 all that the president is doing is using his executive power. This is a formal constitutional power. He can clearly say that we're in a state of peace. He's not encroaching on legislative powers. And James Madison said, no, 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 no. He is definitely encroaching on legislative powers. Him declaring that we're in a state of peace is definitely stating some kind of peace or war position meaning that Congress <laughs> has to change that position, right? He's taking powers from Congress and only Congress can decide if we're in a state of peace or war. Okay, so considering the fact that at the end of this talk, we're going to be talking about the fact that a president could unilaterally assassinate, we can't call it assassination, but he killed a guy who was a member of an Iranian government, a foreign government, and he could do so without consulting Congress, telling Congress, um, giving Congress really any kind of justification, giving the people any kind of justification. The fact that Hamilton and Madison could fight over the possibility that the executive was declaring neutrality should leave us breathless. I mean, what is this <laughs> that we can say that we've gone from these three central figures at the founding arguing over this question to a president who can launch all sorts of attacks all over the world. And those are all under the same constitution. Those are all under the same powers that we see in the um, constitution at the time when Washington was acting and the constitution now when uh, Trump is acting. So I'm gonna spend a second, I'm not gonna go over all of these powers, but this is the formal division of the powers where you see certain powers in the legislative branch and certain powers in the executive branch. And while I obviously have, you know, uh, condensed it, you can see here that the powers are very clearly divided between the two branches. Now there's some, I find interesting debates about 
what what it means to have, uh, for example, the the letter the, the power to issue letters of mark and reprisal. So that's right here. Okay, I wonder if I can get this little guy to work. One second, guys. Sorry. Ten. Okay. So this is the power I'm talking about here. So there's some conversation about whether or not being able to issue uh, letters of mark and reprisals means that Congress not only has the power over declaring war, as we see here, right? uh, but also the power to declare uh, or to have control over the initiation of smaller scale operations. So I can get into that. That's a very nerdy, you know, inside the inside baseball type conversation, but essentially what we can see very plainly from just reading the text as I provide it is that the, the powers are supposed to be shared and thus connected when we're starting any kind of operation and continuing any kind of operation. What happened, however, is that since essentially the mid 20th century, presidents have combined the vesting clause. Okay, so that's the first clause here. Right? The executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States with the Commander in Chief Clause to claim that they have exclusive authority over small scale operations based on their formal, as in constitutional powers. Okay. And what they've done, therefore, is usurp the power or taken it away from Congress. So to make this clearer, uh, the, the Constitution as structured, as set up in the Federalist Paper, or as described in the Federalist Paper, as set up by the founders, as exercised by most presidents until roughly um, Woodrow Wilson, maybe a little bit later, depending on your view, is that there is a division between the two branches. When there's a time of war, power does collect into the hands of the executive, but at the end of the war, power drains from the executive branch. Now, the Constitution is really set up to, to deal with executives trying to encroach on legislative powers. It knows how to deal with that because Congress still has all sorts of powers to combat or you know, beat back the executive branch. It even has the power to deal with the power um, getting siphoned into the executive branch during times of war. Because again, after war is over, after peace is declared, Congress can drain that power out of the executive branch and get back some of its power for itself. What the Congress can't account for, however, and what it can't deal with is when Congress just gives up its power and lets the executive do as it pleases, okay? So I think I'm gonna use um, one of my favorite historical examples, which is the Mexican-American War, because I think it does a nice job of demonstrating how this can go well without being perfect, right? The, the separation of powers, we'll talk about this here, isn't a perfect system, right? It's not supposed to get over the fact that people have ambition. It's not supposed to um, deny the fact that human nature is fallible. All it's trying to do is diminish the amount of harm that can be caused by this problem of human nature, by the very bug in the system, which is us, which is humans. So essentially what happens in the Mexican-American War is that President Polk, as he comes to power, is just desperate for land, desperate to expand the size of the United States and desperate to do so in order to deal with some of the problems he was seeing starting to pop up. So he first started by trying to buy parts of Mexico or then Mexico, now America, from the Mexican government. The difficulty is the Mexican government was rife with all sorts of coups. So they were having a lot of instability there. And on top of that, because uh, Texas had declared independence from Mexico and was like flirting with the United States and flirting with becoming part of the United States, Mexicans hated Americans. Mexicans didn't want to, to deal with the US and any government that came to power saying they would deal with the US was clearly doing the wrong kind of thing, right? It was gonna get ousted very quickly. All right. So it wasn't working very well for the, um, for the United States to try and get uh, the, the Mexicans to, to give us the, the parts of the US that we, or the parts of Mexico that we wanted to become American. 
And so what Polk did was he marched his troops into this area here, okay? And so this disputed area, or not disputed area, but like the part of the Republic of Mexico that was the Republic of Mexico. Unfortunately, it wasn't working very well. So the, the Mexican uh, military was along here, along the Rio Grande, and they weren't firing, they weren't doing anything. So Polk was like, oh my God, all right. So he told the general, uh, Zachary Taylor, to, to march into this disputed territory here. Okay, so they marched from here over to here, okay, and set up shop right on the border or right on the Rio Grande. And so they did what essentially I used to do to my brother during long car rides, which is that you're not touching your sibling, right? You're just really close to them and then they'll thwack your hand away and you, the aggrieved party, can then yell to your parents uh, that, you know, Andrew hit you. And obviously it's Andrew's fault because he is this like malicious actor. And so therefore, you know, you're defending yourself, right? Lots of car time fun. So Polk did essentially the presidential equivalent of this and put the troops right where it was going to tick off the Mexicans as much as possible. And he got his wish, Mexicans fired first, and fired against Taylor's troops. And Taylor sent a letter saying this happened. And so Polk's like, fantastic, great. So he goes to Congress and says to them, you would not believe what the Mexicans did. It was terrible, right? We have to avenge our honor. We have to deal with this. We have to go to war with Mexico over this you know, assault upon us. And what you see then in Congress is a very clear example of Congress doing its constitutional job. What I mean by that is they're uh, discussing the idea of hostilities, discussing the idea of war, asking whether or not you know, the actions of the Mexican general were sanctioned by the Mexican government, asking whether or not we should wait to find out whether Mexican, the Mexican government um, allowed for this or suggested they should do this. And at the same time, you have what I call the, the hurrying language that's always associated with war. And so what happens here is you have people saying, you know, we can't discuss all this. You know, we're not dealing with uh, the important matter, which is we've been assaulted and we have to avenge our honor, blah, blah, blah. All these kinds of things. So like the time for discussion, the time for talk is gone. And uh, so even though you have this hurrying language, you still have people carefully and, and in considered way trying to decide, you know, should we do this? How should we do this? What should we do? And now they came to the wrong conclusion, right? They shouldn't have given Polk his war, but all the same during the war, as they noticed more and more clearly that Polk was just engaged in a war of ambition, they felt bad. They, they felt culpable and responsible. And so every time Polk came back to them for more troops or more help, Congress was more and more and more hesitant to, to give him that. And so this then was a nice example of a flawed reason to go to war, but Congress really doing its duty, even though they came to the wrong conclusion. Okay. So I next wanna go through uh, a clear declaration of war. So you guys see what, the, what it used to look like when Congress very definitively uh, told presidents what they can and can't do. Okay. So first we see here, this is a declaration of war. This is against uh, Japan. Okay. So I'm just gonna highlight a few sections here. So you see the president is authorized, hereby authorized and directed uh, to employ the entire naval and military force of the United States and the resources of the government to carry on war against the imperial government of Japan and to bring the conflict to a successful termination. All the resources of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. So we know what the president is authorized to do we know what resources, military and financial, he has to conduct the war. We know who specifically he is authorized to fight. In this case, the imperial government of Japan, implying, this is very important, that this is not transferable to other future governments, nor is it us against the people of Japan, okay? On top of that, we have a endpoint, a successful, uh, the conflict, uh, they have to bring the conflict to a successful termination. The implication being that we are in a state of war and at the end of it, there will be a treaty of peace and relations between the two countries will return to normal, okay? 
And then finally, what we know is that Congress has a dog in this race. They're stating plainly that they are involved in the decision making. And by implication, if they fail to provide the president with the support he needs, or if they fail to understand the, the nature of the operation, they are also responsible and they should be held accountable. Okay, so this is roughly our last declaration. We had a few more because we were fighting a bunch of guys in World War II. But really the big thing that occurred is after World War II and that's when uh, this warping of the constitutional system really kicked off pretty dramatically. So one of the big things, you have the destruction of the major European powers. <clears throat> That means we're the only ones, right? We're the only ones who can defend liberal democracy against the other meta narrative. So the other meta narrative obviously being communism here. And we, like the communists, were very sure we had picked the, uh, or we had found the, the best form of government, the only form of government that everyone's going to be living under. And it was just a matter of time. The difficulty is when you have two meta narratives saying the exact same thing, it gets very hard for each of them to give it up, right? If only you just work a little harder, if you just invade one more country, you know, overtake one more people, then your meta narrative will win out over the other one. Okay, so the, the choices and the, and the framing of foreign policy decision making during the Cold War were all filtered through the idea of destroying the other meta narrative and ensuring that the American way of life would sustain, would be sustained. As a consequence, we had a dramatically um, increased military, a dramatic increase in military spending, as well as a dramatic increase in the size and scope of uh, military responsibilities. Okay. Um, right, this all came about um, because of what's called NSC 68. It's a very famous document that was released in or given to Truman in 1950. It was roughly April of 1950. Um, and I'll tell you why that's important in a second. And in this document, it says that the Soviets are only going to respond to force. So if we aren't forceful, if we aren't militarily aggressive, then they're going to think we're weak and they're going to respond with even more military force. So our only answer is to just get a huge military. So we are also an 800 pound gorilla, just smashing things all over the place because that's the only thing they respond to. Okay. And the bomb, obviously we already had the bomb as we know from um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but in the spring of 1950, the Soviets also developed the bomb. Now, just as a fun aside, and if people wanna ask about this, I can go into it, but it's too much of an aside for this presentation as I'm already dragging you through <laughs> hundreds of years of history. Um, but the Soviets got the bomb in the spring of 1950. We had NS NSC 68, released in the spring summer of 1960. And the North Koreans invaded South Korea in the summer of 1960, spring summer of 1950 rather. Uh, so you can see that the reasoning for the Korean war was very reactionary, right? What I said at the beginning where presidents started having reactionary policy rather than for forming policy effectively, uh, that kicked off really, really dramatically in the summer of 1950, okay? All right, so then finally in combating the Soviets and combating this uh, dreaded meta-narrative with the power to destroy the world several times over eventually, uh, the Congress and the president and the courts and the people to a meaningful extent all just said to the presidents, here you go, take all this power, take everything you need in order to keep us safe, um, you know, we." We think that we should have faith in you. We think that you should have immense power to, uh, to use the military as you see fit. And we're not going to question a lot of your decision-making. Okay. All right. So uh, we see here also the dramatic expansion of the military personnel and the military expenditure. Right, so if we start, you know, this is World War II, obviously, but you see prior to this point, you have the giant blips for the wars, right? And then it goes back down to very, uh, very small amounts, one, zero, like under 1%. After 
World War II, however, you see this big drop off and this is Korea. Okay, and then it never really drops off again, right, in terms of military expenditure and in terms of military personnel. Okay, so we have a huge standing army after this point. Okay, and what we see in this period is that presidents have to find a new way to justify the kinds of actions that they're engaged in because they can no longer go and ask Congress as much because Congress has said to them, here, you have this power. So what they did instead is they went to their lawyers, right? And so there's this um, office called the Office of Legal Counsel and um, uh, FDR was actually the first one to turn to his attorney general and say, what I'm doing is pretty shady. And what I need you to do is come up with a constitutional reason why this executive agreement uh, which I'm engaged in is constitutionally allowable so that I don't have to get a treaty because then I have to go to Congress or then I have to go to the Senate and the senators aren't going to give me a treaty. So his AG, uh, Robert Jackson, incidentally, said, okay, I'll come up with something. And since that time, we've seen presidents uh, find lots of creative ways of getting around Congress and lots of creative ways of claiming that they have war powers that are absolutely nowhere in the Constitution. Okay, okay. so uh, at this point, I think it's very useful to talk about the War Powers Resolution, also called the War Powers Act, right? because everyone has some sense of the fact that there was something that happened right after Vietnam and it's supposed to contain the president and what actually is or was supposed to be some kind of um, constraint on presidential action actually is much more of a permission slip, okay? So first we get into the president uh, can only initiate, right? So can only aggressive language, right? Look at you, Congress, look at you standing up to the president. You can only initiate military operations if Congress has provided a declaration of war, if Congress has provided specific statutory authorization, or if there's an attack. Now, this entire section, 100% constitutional, right? There would not be a constitutional scholar, alive or dead, including James Madison, who would say, I don't approve of that understanding of the constitutional system, okay? But then, right, so close the door, that's what the constitution says, everybody agrees, door is closed. Then they open it up a little bit by saying, anytime the president introduces the military into an active war zone or deploys them with combat gear and greatly expands their numbers at a foreign base, he must send a report to Congress saying blah, 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 blah. And then we see in this next section, if presidents unilaterally initiate any of these activities, he must draw down troops after 60 days for a max of 90 days unless, and then gives these other reasons. So we see that presidents now have a permission slip to engage in military operations short of you know, all, all out war, full scale war, as long as they do so within 60 to 90 days and they don't have uh, too large of a footprint, okay? So let's see how that's worked out. All right, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker here. Okay, so uh, I won't spend too much time on the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, but essentially you should see that um, Congress was already shirking its responsibilities. I talked a little bit about the Korean War. You should see that it just got worse and worse and worse. There was a bit of a moment in 91, 1991, when George H.W. Bush was saying to Congress, like, I don't need you guys. I can just do the first Gulf War on my own. And Congress was sufficiently uh, loud about it that the, the president decided eventually, you know what, I'll go to Congress, I'll ask them for permission. And there were some restrictions there, there wasn't just a carte blanche kind of um, uh, authorization from Congress in 91. What we really get though in, in 2001 and 2002 were carte blanche authorizations. So as I mentioned before, the 2001 authorization for the use of military force gave Bush the power to go after anyone related to or responsible for 9-11. Okay, so this is terrifyingly broad. This means he can deal with any nation, organization, or person who planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Okay, 
<clears throat> now, even that might look like some kind of restriction because once you get all those guys, it should be that you're done. But that was then interpreted much more broadly to mean terrorists in general, right? Either directly or loosely connected with Al Qaeda even was kind of viewed as necessary. But the one, the piece de resistance of co Congress shirking its responsibility was the 2002 AUMF, that is the, two, the AUMF for the Iraq war, okay? So this is the section I wanted to draw your attention to where the president is authorized to use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary and appropriate in order to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing security threat posed by Iraq and enforce all relevant UN Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. So I can unpack this for 25 minutes, but I'll just do it quickly, which is to say the necessary and appropriate language means that Congress isn't telling him, right? They're not authorizing him to do anything. They're saying to him, whatever you think is necessary and appropriate, you do that, okay? The national security is a wonderful term of art for anything the president wants to do or anything anyone wants to do that may have some indirect or correlated relationship to our national security, right? So let's build bigger walls on the southern border, national security. Let's, um, you know, reinforce the levees in uh, New Orleans, national security, right? Because that could interrupt the, the business in, in New Orleans and that could be detrimental to the security of America, whatever it is. There's all sorts of things that you can say that are related, let's say, to national security, but it's something you can say to just avoid really answering questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. We don't have to talk anymore in the pandemic time, so it's harder to do so for a while. So we also see that it's the security threat posed by Iraq, not the government of Iraq, not uh, Saddam Hussein, Iraq. So it's just the country, right? So this is very, very broad. And then uh, enforcing all relevant UN Security Council resolutions, there's dozens of them in regard to Iraq. So there's all sorts of places you can mine, okay? And so this is the situation we've gotten ourselves into now, is that even when Congress authorizes an authorization, including the, Gulf, including the Vietnam War, the two Persian Gulf Wars and the war in Afghanistan, even when they authorize military operations, they aren't performing their constitutional duties. Okay, so this is a level of irresponsibility and a level of pulling back from being a co-equal branch that allows the presidency to just become so broad and so all-inclusive that it's no wonder we have difficulty creating and executing like sound foreign policy decision-making. All right, so let's look at uh, just this one example from uh, Obama and then we'll go into Trump and Soleimani. Okay, because this is probably the foreign policy that we're roughly going back to. And I say that because uh, Biden is going to pretty much employ most of the people who were in the Obama administration. He was more on the realist side uh, compared to the liberal internationalists, right? So the liberal internationalists um, par excellence is Susan Power, if that, mean names, or th if that name means anything for you guys. And so Biden was more of a realist than Susan Power, than, well, everyone's more of a realist than Susan Power. But those kinds of people, so a realist combo with neo, um, or sorry, liberal internationalists, that's what we're essentially going to see, uh, I predict anyway, in the Biden administration. And it's so pleasant for me, I'll say as well, to be back into a situation where there's predictability in the kinds of screw ups that we're going to see in the foreign policy realm, which I get is not a high bar, but it's a very comforting bar for me um, as, a, as a scholar of these things. So Obama, Syria, let's get into this. As you guys remember, maybe the, um, the Obama administration or Obama himself initiated or created what he accidentally called a red line in 2012. In 2012, he said that if Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian leader would use any kind of uh, chemical weapons against his people, that would be a red line that would change his calculation. So by 2013, we had clear examples of Assad using chemical weapons against his people. 
And so Obama said, all right, I've got I've to react militarily. And this is August, 2013. <laughs> and then at the end of August, in this piece de resistance of, of you know, uh, political theater, he said, oh, I just remembered <laughs> that I'm the leader of the oldest constitutional democracy. So I should really get Congress's permission, right, an authorization before I engage in any kind of military action. So he says this and Congress is like, good for you, Obama. Good for you for involving us. We're not gonna give you an authorization though. And he's like, all right, well then we're not doing anything. And everyone's like, uh, okay, right? And there's all sorts of problems with that, but let's move on to the next year. Okay, so this is, um, as you see, June, 2014, ISIS by this point, uh, there was so much instability in Iraq and Syria and a few other parts of the region that ISIS had really taken over. And the big thing was when they captured Mosul because there's a big Mosul dam and there's a possibility of really screwing up the power source and causing all sorts of unbelievable destruction if you obviously opened the dam. So insofar as you're never sure what a terrorist network is going to do, then you really don't want them having control over something like this, especially because ISIS makes Al Qaeda looks reasonable and measured, right? To the point where the Al Qaeda leadership was saying to ISIS, could you guys tone down your violent tactics? And ISIS said, no, you know, we're, we're doing this and we're, we're doing it very effectively. We have a caliphate, right? So at this point, Obama essentially felt compelled to act. So his rhetoric about needing Congress and needing some kind of authorization flew out the window and he just starts bombing mostly Iraq to a certain extent, Syria. And what he's doing then is also very interesting. He's sending a letter to Congress every single time he engages some kind of, and he engages in some kind of bombing operation. So he's acting as if it's not a sustained bombing campaign, but discrete examples of a bombing campaign, okay? And he's likely doing this because of the war powers uh, resolution, because he has 60 days once he starts the clock, right, to, to finish the operation and draw down. As we know, that's not what happened with ISIS. It's not gonna be that you can deal with ISIS in 60 days, let alone 90. So he was working around it. And um, by September, right, so this is months later, by September, it became a very apparent that there was no way they were going to deal with it in any sort of short order. So that's when he started turning to the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Okay, so this is the first very clear and big example of a president using authorizations that are more than a decade old in order to carry out a bombing campaign against an entirely different group of people who are admittedly still very bad people. No one thinks ISIS should just stick around. But all the same, <laughs> Obama is working against or working around Congress so aggressively that he's using laws that were passed well before his presidency that have very little, if anything, to do with ISIS or the ground campaign against uh, defeating them. And we see that this is the reaction or this is the best example of the reaction from Congress. Okay, so this is from Jack Kingston, who is a Republican from Georgia. And he said, quote, a lot of people would like to stay on the sidelines and say, just bomb the place and tell us about it later. It's an election year. A lot of Democrats don't know how it would play in their party and Republicans don't wanna change anything. We like the path we're on now. We can denounce it if it goes bad and praise it if it goes well and ask what took him so long, okay? And this is not a dramatically different Congress than the one we have today. This is not a dramatically different Congress than the one we've had for 20, 30, 40 years. So we should have every expectation that this is exactly the same kind of uh, Congress that we're going to see once, a, once Biden takes over, okay? So I'm gonna take one more second to talk about Soleimani and then I'll open it up for, for questions. All right, so I'm not gonna go over all of this. And I, I recognize also this is a big <laughs> slide with lots going on um, right at the end of a presentation, which is uh, very bad present presentationing and professoring here. So I apologize, but I just wanted all this information there in case you're looking for the, the TikTok of what happened. So the big moment I wanna to get to is in 2019, 
Okay, um, this is the um, Tishran revolution and the US pulling out of Syria, right? So we had won against ISIS, right? That problem solved, just like Al Qaeda and the Taliban are. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little too glib. I'll, I'll pull back. Okay, so October, we have this and we have um, Prime Minister Abdil Abdul Mahdi uh, worried about what it is that was happening in his government and worried about all of the, all the protesting that was occurring. Because essentially what happened is by the time you get to 2019, things feel safer in Iraq. And so people start saying, you know, where is all the money from all the oil revenues, right? Why is it that all of these um, government leaders have beautiful homes, beautiful cars, um, take lavish vacations? You know, it seems like there's a lot of corruption. And during these October protests, uh, Major General Qasem Soleimani slips into Baghdad to help out uh, Maldi and, and to help him hold on to his job. And so it's likely what happened, but we don't have clear evidence of this yet, but what's likely what happened is that um, Soleimani and Mahdi hatched a plan to redirect the protesting from the Iraqi government to the American, the continued sustained American presence in Iraq. Okay, and that's when we started getting all of these protests against Americans and the American embassy. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's over, over Christmas time for us in 2019, right? Remember when we can still see our families? Uh, and then um, in early January, right? When some of us are still kind of like recovering from the holidays, we get the lethal drone strike against uh, Qasem Soleimani and you know the world's kind of thrown into its hizzy because we know that Iran's going to react. We know that there's some sort of reaction coming because we have given very limited justification. We said uh, Soleimani was engaged in uh, imminent attacks against Americans, said that there was uh, no other way of responding to this, okay? And so we see that the Iranians then respond with a number of ballistic missiles and they're launched against a couple of air bases. And what we saw is a terrifying level of precision from them. They knew exactly what they wanted to hit. They wanted to hit places with no military occupancy and they did very effectively. What we then see um, after the attack is Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, tweeting that Iran took and concluded proportional measures in self-defense and they targeted the base from which cowardly arms attacked against our citizens and senior officials were launched. We do not seek to escalate or have war, but we'll defend ourselves against any aggression. Okay. What we see soon thereafter is the very unfortunate and tragic downing of flight PS752, where hundreds of people were killed. Okay. Or sorry, 176 people were killed. Okay. And this was entirely caused by human error. So what were we doing? Uh, this was an, assass was this an assassination, okay? Um, assassination is the killing of a prominent person for political or ideological reasons. So um, during uh, the killing of, a pro killing of a person during an ongoing legal armed op operation doesn't count as an assassination because this is again, a lawful killing in theory during an armed conflict. Okay, um, so was killing Soleimani legal under US domestic law? Um, it's an exercise of the president's constitutional authority, right? The same constitutional authority that I claim is extremely warped. Um, and Trump can make this claim, right? And others can make this claim for him. And now this is the important part. The legal view as to what is permitted by law in terms of the use of military force really is pretty well defined by the executive branch itself. Okay. So, <clears throat> more concerning still, there's still no real law against these kinds of actions. Congress tried and failed to include provisions in the 2002 defense budget that would impede Trump from using force against Iran, but they failed. On top of that, if Soleimani had intended to attack Americans imminently, uh, this would have still fallen below the threshold of Congress's constitutional authority. So based on this understanding of his Article II powers, regardless of whether he adheres 
to a plain reading of the text, there are very little, if any, legal constraints on the president's uh, power, okay? And we've seen this during several presidents, right? We've seen that Congress doesn't hold them accountable, even when they are claiming to hold them accountable, accountable and providing them with an authorization. It's certainly the case that congressional investigations um, were embarrassing for the Bush administration, for example, with Iraq, but didn't slow down the Iraq war or lead to its successful conclusion, okay? Um, when Obama came into office, his surge in Afghanistan, as we know now from the Afghan papers, uh, didn't uh, improve the situation on the ground, didn't uh, improve the, the grand strategy of the United States or ensure some kind of um, successful conclusion to the Afghan war. Um, as Rosa Brooks noted in 2013, right now we have an executive branch making a claim that it has the right to kill anyone anywhere on earth at any time for secret reasons based on secret evidence in a secret process undertaken by unidentified officials. And that frightens me. And at present, <laughs> those secret powers and unchecked powers are in the hands of one man who is feeding off the partisan divide in the country and still has two or three months left in office. So can Congress really assert itself in the face of this and in this partisan atmosphere? It's very unlikely. So right now, whether or not the US is going to uh, do anything else that's potentially impacting its national security for the next two, three months is in the hands of one man. And that is Donald Trump. <laughs>